here's where we're going. I mean, we've got three sessions. We've got you know, tonight, tomorrow night, and all day Saturday to pull off a, a genuine biblical miracle, and that is to communicate everything that you need to know uh, <laughs> about the Bible and God's view of civil government mm -hmm. in that time. You know, good luck with that, right? Yeah, so I, what you're, what you're going to get, of course, is you're not going to get a whole master's or doctoral degree in law and politics and the integration of theology in those disciplines, but what we're going to try and do is give you a big picture framework of all of these areas of law, government, politics, theological integration, and hit some of the key issues and then talk about some of the practical application for this. What do you actually do with it? How do you make change with it? Because that's why you know, you're here, hopefully, is not just to gain more knowledge, but to know how to be a doer of the word once we know that we ought to do it. And then maybe elbow the people at your church, maybe your pastor or something, that they can uh, get involved in this as well uh, and promote some of these things. So again, introductions, and here's what we're going to go for the rest of the evening, is that uh, we'll introduce uh, myself and then Dr. Waller introduce himself, give our backgrounds, sort of give our opening statements, uh, so to speak, for our case for why Christians should be involved in the public square. Uh, then Dr. Waller is going to give you a, a quick overview, when I say quick, He's a professor of political science, so quick means here's a condensed version of everything you need to know about basic civics, okay? Mm -hmm. Because that's a lost knowledge base in our culture. And then after that, uh, I, what I'm going to do is, uh, again, do another second miracle, and that's condense a three-unit, 15-week course into three hours. Uh, <laughs> that's my theology at church and state class that I do, because mm -hmm. as Christians, what we need to do is make sure that what we're doing is biblical, that we're doing it God's way. Because part of the problem is that we let the U.S. Supreme Court, politicians, the public square tell us how we should think about church and state instead of stepping back, blowing away the breeze, and saying, what does God have to say about this, and how do we keep a perspective on this as Christians? So we'll do that. We'll end up with... Uh, Again, end up tonight looking at the beginning of a theology of church and state. We'll have about halfway through tomorrow, we'll finish that. Then we'll pick up on a number of other topics that we'll cover for the rest of the time. For example, we'll talk about what, is, what are the founding fathers' issues. We'll talk about the key issues in constitutional law uh, that we all need to know about. How, what happened in the Constitution that permitted the declination of religious liberty and morality in society? And then we'll look at how to fix it. We will look at some critical issues such as abortion, homosexual marriage, and think about how to talk about these things in the public square. Uh, we'll also talk about uh, issues of what can you do as a church and as a Christian that's legal, that's permissible, so you're not going to cross any lines. Half the battle with some of the churches who even want to do things is they don't know where the lines are drawn, so they're afraid of stepping over their 501c3 boundaries. So. Again, we'll give you that, and then we're going to give you ample time for questions as well. So uh, between all of that, hopefully you'll get enough political philosophy, law, theology, and everything else to equip you to do what's necessary. So that's where we're at. That's where we're going with the course. All of you should have received when you came in a survey. Uh, that's going to help Dr. Waller and I, so, you know, as you fill that out, you know, we're not going to, you know, make up our answers as we go. But... Seeing your input and what you consider valuable is going to be helpful for us because we do have some discretionary parts of our lecture and what to emphasize or what to cover in, uh, in question areas. So if you fill out that survey, turn it into us either at the break or afterwards, that would be helpful. So, all right, with that, uh, before we begin, are there any questions from you about where we're going with the course or anything you'd like to know uh, about the content or anything before we move on? Once, twice, okay, good. Then um, here's where we're at. I'm going to introduce myself. I'm Kevin Lewis. I've been teaching here at Biola for almost 20 years now. And I'm a professor of theology and law in the Master of Arts Christian Apologetics program. And my background, again, I have a number of areas that are my areas of teaching and research interest. Uh, my first love has always been the Bible and systematic theology. Uh, why? Be because it's the Word of God, because it's the only inspired book on the planet. And people ask me, man, you, you, 
that whole religion and politics thing. You're, you're doing the thing that you're not supposed to do, talk about religion and politics. Now, I'm looking at the things that affect me the most. Yeah. Who's going to affect you the most now and in eternity? God and the law. Uh, so those are the two things you should know the best, in my opinion, uh, not the least. So those, that was my decision. Uh, not only to know, first and foremost, to teach systematic theology and a, a calling to that, is to be able to articulate and defend the Christian religion. But then, when I began, I also was doing apologetics. So, general apologetics, how to defend against atheism, you know, how to show the existence of God, and how to know that we have knowledge. But then, I specialized some other courses and areas I teach in, uh, such as I teach a course called Cults of America, a uh, course called Demonology and the Occult, uh, and then, uh, of course, the whole church-state area. Uh, and then in systematic theology, we deal with the area of polemic uh, and dealing with heretics in the church. They're false doctrines that uh, pretend to be Christian, and they lead people away from Christ. So you can see the trend. It starts from orthodoxy, heretics, cults, demons, and lawyers. So it's a nice progression, <laughs> you know, down the slide there where you know what's <laughs> going to go on. Well, for... Uh, yeah, so for that, those are my areas of research interest. I've been here uh, teaching at Biola almost 20 years, the last 12 or so at the graduate level, teaching for Talbot School of Theology up to 2007, and been here in the MA Apologetics program. Uh, again, uh, lots of background, but uh, besides the fact that I'm a uh, professor here, uh, my specialty areas are, again, theology, law, uh, law courses. I have a course on theology of church and state, legal evidence and apologetics. Uh, I'm currently writing a book on the theology of church and state. do a lot of lecturing on that. Um, uh, other areas that I have, I'm also an attorney, so don't hold that against me, mm -hmm. uh, but I practice in the area of uh, First Amendment litigation, uh, writs, appeals, and nonprofit corporations, so basically helping churches uh, with their legal needs, so to try and integrate this the best we can. So, uh, so that's my background. Married uh, 25 years now. He's had our 25th anniversary. Have two near-perfect kids, uh, which I tell them all the time. And uh, so if I didn't be believe in original sin, I'd probably have different ideas, but I have really good kids. So uh, very happy about that. So uh, that's my background. And I'll turn it over to Dr. Waller. He can introduce himself. By the way, the better looking one is Dr. Waller. <laughs> and okay, you get the idea. So go ahead, Dr. Waller. Thank you, Kevin. Well, uh, as you'll soon discover, uh, Kevin and I have quite different styles. Uh, I find his a lot more entertaining, so I will uh, give him uh, his due. Uh, I'm Scott Waller. I'm a uh, native of St. Louis, Missouri. If we have any uh, Midwesterners here. Uh, uh, we're still an official period of mourning that our Cardinals have not made the playoffs. So uh, I take no interest in the fact that the Giants won last night other than the lamenting the fact that we didn't win. Uh, I've been married uh, 23 years, coming up this January, uh, to a woman who's, uh, I just, as many of the men in this audience will attest to, married over their head. And uh, I have two wonderful kids. Uh, we, are, we are now solidly Southern Californians, uh, with due to the fact that if, uh, if it rains even one day, we start to moan and complain, which uh, is, uh, is, is a sure sign you're a Southern Californian. Uh, I have uh, degrees both in philosophy and ethics, and I have a master's in politics and a PhD in politics. I teach here at the university. I teach basic American survey of American government, trying to convert my uh, undergraduate friends to the virtues of uh, understanding the American political order and, and see a few conversions every semester where I light the fire and, and light a light bulb for a few folks who think that uh, they might want to uh, pursue some more uh, study on in the American government. I teach uh, comparative government. I, we look at different e economic and political systems and compare them to the American system of government. I teach ancient and modern political philosophy. So if you're interested in the uh, theoretical underpinnings of the American political order or how, what the ancients thought ought to be the case, I, I, I teach those courses. I, I taught a class last semester on church-state relations, and that's really my specialty in terms of what I did my dissertation in and, and what I take most research interest in is the role of the relationship between the church and the state or the role of religion in the public order. 
and surprise, surprise, you'll get a glimpse of that. Uh, the role of religion has taken a quite different uh, take here in modern times versus what they were, uh, say, 230, 40 years ago. So we'll have opportunity to talk a bit about that. Um, in terms of what I'd like to do for this course, um, Kevin and I are, are, are doing our level best to marry our fields and give you a, 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 a substantive look, but, but it, uh, by, by the nature of our limited time together, give you a, give you a sense of a, of a look at some key areas that we need to be thinking about as believers. If we're going to be Christians in the public square, it's likely that we're going to have to be better than our contemporaries who, who don't follow Christ. Uh, because there are certain handicaps and certain stereotypes that, that in large measure we have to overcome. And uh, uh, instead of developing a small man complex and a woes me complex, um, it's incumbent upon people like us to, to get together in these kinds of venues and start to infect people in our churches. And, and largely we're going to be better if we're better thought and, and we're more Christ-like in a, in a public venue. And, and those two things are incredibly winsome. Um, as, as we are Christ-like and demonstrate qualities that are, that are naturally attractive to people, we're going to turn heads. But, but that, that, is, that goes just a step of the way, I would argue. Another step is that we're going to have to be people to, who understand what they're talking about. And that means that we need to understand arguments that have been raised up against us. I'm in a class uh, a month ago with my, with my undergrads in American government and I relayed to them the, uh, the account of the rise of a Tea Party candidate in Delaware named Christine O'Donnell, if you're familiar with this. And she was being parodied to death upon her ascendancy to the Republican nomination there for the Senate in Delaware because she actually had the temerity to make an argument based upon a biblical precept. And the, and the liberal news media just took off with it and was just parodying her to death. And a freshman in the back of the class raised his hand and said, well, isn't that by definition a, a violation of church and state? That she would make an argument based upon a biblical precept for a, for a social stance on an issue. Um, I think it happened to be the, the sanctity of marriage or heterosexual marriage or something of that nature. So what it reveals is that we've, we're soaked in a culture that is just in, has this ingrained idea that religion is meant to be private and that it is to have no public import, and that when we take it to the public square, um, particularly within the scholarly elite community, many people raise the specter of the First Amendment in the Church of State, and that's supposed to just shut us down immediately. So Kevin and I uh, have devoted a fair amount of time in this course to talking and speaking to the constitutional issues. I'm not a lawyer. I'm glad for that. I'm thankful for that. Hey, watch it. I, I sleep very good at night as a result of that. Um, but uh, we're trying to marry our fields here and give you a sense of it. Tonight, I want to give you just an hour of basic civics. Um, and, and the reason I wanted to do that was because I wanted to give you a, a, a some touch points and, and some, uh, some points of reference as we go forward this semester. In order to understand the current American constitutional order, I'll have to hearken you back to the fact that this isn't our first Amer constitutional order. Uh, there's this little thing called the Articles of Confederation, and it set up a very different gig than what we have now. And, and the Constitution was meant to be a corrective to some things that were going on there. So I wanna, I wanna give you a, a sense of that. Um, so what else here? Um, we, we want to give you, uh, I see my contribution to, to our class here is to be able to give you this sense that if you are going to be people who are operating in the public square, um, I want to give you a sense of what is out there. What, what, is the, what is the lay of the land that you're going to encounter? What are the major ideas that you'll encounter? What are the potential pitfalls that you'll encounter, particularly in the political aspect? As, as we operate in these waters. Um, we need to be the kind of people who understand the, the categories and the, and the major ideas out there so that we can interact with them. And not just, and, and, and Kevin and I will continually ex to exhort you, don't keep this to yourself. Um, be able to share these kinds of things with others and, and interact with people, lead Sunday school classes about these kinds of things and infect others. Because as I said before, I think it's largely the case given 
uh, the, the track history has saved the Christian faith in general over the last hundred years, we have some hurdles to overcome. And we have some things that I think we need to engage. And, and we may actually have to be better. I, I can tell you studying in a secular environment as long as I have, um, and Jonathan and I studied uh, the same school together years ago, um, in many senses we had to be better. I was invited as a, as a token evangelical to, a, to participate in a research and study group. And the focus of the study was evangelicals and politics. And the people who were involved in this research group were all PhDs or soon to be PhDs and they knew nothing about people like you and me. And it became quickly evident when a few things got thrown around and, and one of the people in the group said the following, oh, those evangelicals, they're all just eschatological. And they had a big belly laugh about it. And what was interesting and what I knew was that they had no idea what they were talking about because the phrase really just doesn't carry a lot of sense. It just it didn't mean anything. So after the accordant time, I, I politely raised my hand and I said, Amanda, what do you mean by that? And she said, you know, I don't know. <laughs> and it was a moment of power, not that I was seeking power, but it was a moment of power in a sense that she was embarrassed and the people in the room had all laughed about it, realized that they, they had demonstrated kind of a religious bigotry and that they, they, were, they, they were humbled and the power gained when they asked me, well, what could I have meant by that? And I had an opportunity, they gave me a, a, a dry erase marker and a dry erase board and said, well, could you explain to us what eschatology is and why these evangelicals might be interested in, in such a project? And I had an opportunity in a very real sense to lay the gospel out before these people. And as I'm doing this, I'm thinking, what, what, a, what an amazing opportunity by asking one question. But the reason I knew to ask the question is because I was ahead of the conversation a bit. What this will allow you to do in many senses to get, is to get ahead of some conversations to where you'll be able to know what, what kinds of questions to ask. So there's four things I'd like to do, and then we'll transition in, 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 uh, by way of doing some basic civics. First, I'd like to give you some, some idea of, of some basic civics. Um, again, it'll give you a barometer in terms of making an assessment. You'll need to develop your own view on this. Kevin and I have views that we'll be, be sure to share with you about the nature of um, religion and the, and the political order and what we think ought to be done about it. But at the end of the day, you're going to have to come to your own conclusions on this. So we'll, we'll be as fair as we can in presenting not only our views, but, but just sort of the general lay of the land. And in, this, in, in a lot of senses, you'll need to understand some basic civics in order to be able to do that, particularly as they relate to how religion related at the beginning or, or in the political order uh, with the Constitution and even prior to that. I'll give you a sense of that. Um, secondly, I, um, tomorrow night, I'd like to talk to you about the nature of the political task. What is politics? And I will make the case to you, and you may, for those of you who've read uh, Frank, Beckwith, Frank Beckwith's book, and others have argued that the nature of politics entails a, mor a moral project. That politics by its very nature entails a moral project. Uh, Beckwith argues in his book that statecraft, the idea of being involved in politics, has something to do with shaping men and women's souls. Now, now I during my graduate studies, I was also involved in full-time ministry and I, I had a fair amount of time, say over 20 years, to interact with people and, and, and get a sense of people's souls. And I can testify to you that people's souls have been horribly harmed by things that we find ourselves immersed in in, in public culture today. In fact, in many senses, it, it has left them cold, not just resistant, but just stone cold to the gospel because of ideas that they've heard and that, that dominate within not just the academic community, but the, but the culture as a whole. So that's the second thing I'd like to do. Thirdly, on Saturday morning, Kevin and I are going to tag team in constitutional law. And uh, predominantly, he's going to look at the 14th Amendment, which uh, forever has changed the American system of government, at least in terms of how the US Supreme Court has interpreted uh, the, the amendment. I will, I will spend uh, a good amount of time Saturday morning uh, unpacking the First Amendment for you and giving you some sense of what it means now to just throw out the phrase separation of church and state, which, which you probably know is nowhere to be found in the text of the Constitution. But it has become constitutional 
um, starting uh, somewhat in the, in the 19th century, but most notably in, in, in a 1940s case. And then I want to give you a sense of what um, the lay of the land is since the 1940s in terms of how the First Amendment is interpreted. How is religion viewed in this? When is religion allowed to stay in the public square and when is it banished? Um, and you'll have some nice points of comparison to, to look at and say, boy, how far have we come since the founding era where now we have nine people sitting in robes at the U.S. Supreme Court, which is an interesting question, isn't it, in itself? That nine people in robes uh, sitting in a marble palace in D.C. determine for us uh, these great questions of, of public moment, uh, the role of religion in the public square, the abortion debate, euthanasia. At one point in time in U.S. history, the U.S. Supreme Court thought it had solved the slavery issue when in reality it lit the fuse for a bloody war that lasted four years and cost hundreds of thousands of lives. So we'll, we'll talk about the nature of judicial power in regards to a uh, little bit of constitutional law. And then the last thing I'd like to do is talk to you about the notion of liberty. The notion of liberty has morphed quite a bit from uh, the founding era and what the founders arguably meant by liberty versus what it means today. Essentially, liberty has been equated with, with a loose licentiousness that, we're, that we should be free constitutionally to do whatever we'd like to do, uh, only fettered by some uh, small notion of what's called the harm principle, that we shouldn't be harming people. So those are the four things that I'd like to do. Kevin is going to uh, give us a broad tapestry of theologically. I'm not professionally trained theologian. <coughs> So I think this is a nice mix to be able to bring these two fields together. There'll be somewhat of overlap, but I think both of us want to make this interactive. We, we, we don't want to just sit up here and, and, and talk. We've, we've been doing this long enough to know that it's, it's hard to sit in these kinds of environments, even if the, if the topic is engaging, without being able to engage and, and interact and dialogue. So we hope to have a fair amount of that. So. So that's all I have to say in terms of opening. Kevin, shall I dive into some stuff, or you, you have other well, things here? I have uh, my opening statement here. Please. We'll uh, go ahead. May it please the court. Yes. This, uh, is, this is a lawyer in action here. Judge Waller. So, <laughs> all right, yeah. Yeah, as you see, we've we got a lot to cover uh, the next two and a half days, uh, approximately, that we're going to have here. But here's, here's a case I want to make. I mean, it, it comes down to this. Why should Christians be involved in the public square? Uh, Dr. Waller's going to give you his reasons, but I want to give you my reasons, and I want to raise a bunch of issues, and just I want to give you a big picture here of the things that we are facing. Uh, the first is to understand we, we are going through a worldview shift in this country. Uh, we really did start out as a Christian nation. You know, that, people can debate what that means, but the fact is is that when you look at the folks at, at the time of the Revolutionary War, 98.5% of them were self-proclaimed Christians, okay? That was the percentage. Now, what that, what that would mean for the nation to be it, their worldview was Christian orthodoxy. They were monotheist. They understood the creator-creation distinction. Unfortunately, what is, has been, what is and has been creeping into our system is paganism and naturalism. What we've got is polytheism, uh, which sometimes is a functional atheism because everybody's their own god, because they do functionally you know, what they want to do whenever they want to do it. Now, they're organized neo-pagan religions, but the ultimate point of neo-paganism is to do whatever you want, whenever you want, and add spirituality to it. That is, as, as Dr. Waller pointed out earlier, it's licentiousness, or in theological terms, it's antinomianism. There is no law. I am a law to myself. Or it's autonomianism, okay? There's nothing that transcends law and nothing to which I'm subject. And of course, naturalism, which both Dr. Waller and I could be talk about for hours. But the point is this, when you look at a worldview and its structure, you look at its ontology, we are facing either explicit or implicit naturalism, which is that the only thing that exists are a bunch of accidentally rammed together physical particles. That's what naturalism is. That's what atheism is. And if that's true, then everything that exists is reducible to chaotically clumped physical particles. 
everything, love, justice, trees, rocks, chirping birds, nature, right, all of this, it, that's, that's all it is. So you tell me why there's any meaning, why there's any should, why there's any ought. But yet you have at the, our, the universities we founded, the Harvards, the Yales, and the Princetons, we've got folks who are advocating this kind of junk and saying this is what should be public policy. It's autonomianism or antinomianism. So and how did it get that way? See, we're to blame. When I say we, you're saying the church. We own this culture and we gave it away. And we say we did it, our leaders did it. And that's why you, know, you, you have got to poke, poke, poke your leaders. Why? Because the lay people are never the ones that give away the church or its institutions. It's always the leaders who either want to be considered smart people by the culture or nice people by the culture. So there's a pressure for them to conform. And then what you see is constantly is now our institutions get an emphasis on scholasticism over against biblical fidelity, or irenicism. They want to be nice and not have any conflict. Unity, unity, unity at all costs. When the fact is, no, Jesus said I came to divide. And I'm going to talk about that as we go through. And when we lose the will to be able to divide over what is true, to be able to identify what is true and what's essential, this is what we're going to see. We're going to see this dialectic where our opponents come in and ask for a lot more than they want, and then they want to split the baby, and then they move their agenda halfway forward. And then they ask for it again, they keep splitting the baby and splitting the baby until we end up with, what are we voting for now? We had to vote on whether marriage would be between one biological man and one biological woman. If I told you 20 or 30 years ago there'd be a public vote on that, you'd think that I was crazy, uh, or anyone else that suggested it. But you want to know what's coming? Look at the animal rights movement. Look at some of these other things that are coming up. Uh, what you think may be impossible is not impossible here. And that's something that we need to uh, probably be aware of. But these are bigger problems of the worldviews of neo-paganism and naturalism that are affecting our culture. And there's only one way to, to stop it, and that's for the church to get informed, make disciples, and make sure that every single person is rock solid uh, on these areas and will be a multiplication, a multiplying disciple. You will go out and make disciples of others and doing it. And when we do that, we'll start to see it turn around. Uh, also, on the issue of freedom, and again, a couple of things here. We've got to change the worldview, but we've got to change the notion of freedom. Christians are too uninformed and reticent about arguing for what freedom is. Uh, I'll cover this in the theological lecture, but I want to introduce it. The biblical view of freedom is free to do God's will. That's what freedom is. The idea that you're free to do whatever you want is clearly an unbiblical, pagan, naturalist notion. Uh, so, you know, free, if Christ has fret, set you free, you're free indeed. Don't return again to the yoke of slavery. The whole idea of being in bondage to sin uh, means that our will, our nature was in bondage and it, it was impossible for us to, to do and to want the things of God. Now we're set free to walk the path we should have been walking in the first place. Those are the things that, you know, so what does that mean for all mankind? I'll talk about that later on, but we've got to get a right notion of freedom. Third, we have got to start playing offense in the culture. We have been playing defense so long that essentially what we do is the Supreme Court or some local court makes a decision or the legislature makes a decision and what happens? We respond to it. And Sometimes we stop them, sometimes we turn it around, but most of the time we're not. And we let them set the rules for how to play the game. Think about what's been going on since the 1940s, where essentially God was outlawed from public life. Again, Cantwell versus Connecticut, 1940, and Everson versus Board of Education in 1940. The U.S. government, the federal courts, took control of the religion questions. And ever since then, separation of church and state has been pressed ultimately to mean if your church is in our state, we want you to leave, okay? Uh, that's what people are, <laughs> essentially, that's what the naturalists want. They want a pure secular society. Uh, they want, you know, like communist Chinese controlled churches. Uh, they want to be able to regulate religion. And like I said, you think that's impossible, you know, think about what happened with homosexual marriage. This stuff is possible when you think about what our opponents want to do. So again, stop letting the other people set the rules. 
Uh, there are two ways we have to talk about this. One is that God really exists and Christianity is really true. Okay, if you're trying to win arguments uh, about normative values, the way things ought to be, but you can't bring God in the picture, you will always lose because God is the only source of normative values. It's not, how are you going to get an ought or a should from a bunch of stardust that accidentally clumped together? All you got are different dust bunnies bumping into each other. Mm -hmm. That's what the universe is. There is no should or ought. And, and that's why we just need to say, stop it. I don't care about those rules. You know, this is what we need to do. We need to not violate our conscience. We need to follow the ways that God says. And until we stop playing their game, you know, we're, we're going to keep losing. So offense. And there's two things we have to do. One, yeah, we, the, the rules are what the rules are right now. So in other words, we're in a game of football. What's the best way to score a touchdown while playing football? We've got to win elections. We've got to abide by campaign laws because otherwise the U.S. Marshals or the police will come. They'll fine you. They'll do all sorts of things. And at the same time, we have to talk about we don't want to play football anymore. What's it, what, let's, how do we get rid of this and play a different game with a different set of rules? Okay? So we have to have at least have that at the forefront so we can think about how we get out, out of this situation we're in. Because if we just keep responding to what the opposition's doing, we won't win. Um, next, let me think about uh, how these things happen. <sighs> think about the fall of culture itself. Again, just how we got to where we're at today. And I can just tell you this, this is a history of uh, the church and a history of theology. As the church becomes weak, then the culture becomes weak. Why? Because the church no longer takes strong stands for justice, for righteousness, for transcendent morality. And what you end up with are compromise views. You end up with you know, all sorts of ideas of tolerance and so forth. But we, we want to tolerate all sorts of evil in the culture. And we want to relegate what are simply clear things, like abortion is wrong, to a private choice. And again, we'll look at you know, things like fact-value dichotomies. But how did the culture fall? Pretty easy. See, we used to, when the Puritans came over, they started a couple of schools of higher learning called Harvard and Yale. <laughs> okay? uh, they started out as seminaries for Protestant pastors. And if you go back and read 17th century theology and 16th century theology, you find out this is some of the best stuff ever written. These were bright people, but what was important is that they understood the Bible and the Christian life as just that. The Bible applies to all of life, not just the church. And this is the problem. So what did they do? They built universities. They built not just a seminary to train pastors, but they built places that had law schools, medical schools, everything else, so that God's truth could be applied in an entire civilization, not just in the church. Okay? Now enter the, the quote-unquote enlightenment and liberalism in the church. And what do you have? Now you have the church compromising, rejecting Jesus Christ, rejecting the authority of the Bible. And what do you get now? You get theism running it and natural law. Okay? Well, we don't have the Bible run anymore, so we don't really have Christian universities. So now it's, you know, conscience, natural law, and whatever scholarship in those legal, psychological, or philosophical departments says is rational to believe. 200 years later, where are we at? You know, the real Christians are out of Harvard and Yale and Princeton, and we're at Biola, Multnomah, and all these other places. So where are the law schools? Where are the medical schools? Where are the schools of public policy? And then what we've got in the 20th century are the reactions to the liberalism in the church and our universities. So we have a fundamentalist movement. Now, fun, what, fundamentalist movements are good. We went back to the scriptures. But what do the fundamentalists encourage? Only making good churches. And that's the problem. We had really good churches, but the problem is the culture was rotting. The Supreme Court was rotting. The legislature was rotting. Why? Because Christians weren't influencing the public square. We didn't have a theology that motivated us to do it. We thought that the Bible was only for making, you know, making disciples and making a church instead of making an entire way of life. So we didn't use the Bible and infuse it in all areas of knowledge and do real integration. Now enter the late 1940s or we see the rise of the evangelical movement. What, was, what were the evangelicals about? 
They're about saying, brother fundamentalists, we love you and we believe in good churches, but we also believe we need to get back in the public square. But what was the problem with that? The problem with that was, is we've been kicked out of the institutions. They didn't want to let us back in. We found out they weren't as tolerant as they said they were. And they don't want as much diversity as they say they, they want. You know, they don't want, you know, Bible-believing, you know, scholastic evangelicals at these places. Okay? So here, this is where we're at. And then now you look at the various modern movements of what's an evangelical and what's out there today. I, I mean, I kid you not, the word evangelical is virtually worthless now. It, it really is. Uh, I mean, there, you have to have about two or three adjectives now to try and understand what an evangelical is. I kid you not, they're liberal evangelicals, neo-evangelicals, post-conservative evangelicals. It's probably a SpongeBob evangelical. I don't know <laughs> uh, what they have going on. But the reality is, is it just doesn't mean a Bible-believing, conservative, inerrantist believer anymore. So we scrap that. Now we have to start over again. And eventually, you're going to have to have about 27 adjectives before the word Christian because there's so many incomplete and false views of it. But you know, that's to say this, is that when you start thinking about what it means for Christianity in the public square, I'll just say this, you don't get Christianity from any other discipline except theology and Bible. That's important. If it's Christian, it has to come from the Bible because natural law theism, God exists and we ought to be good, is not in and of itself Christian. It might be theistic, but it's not salvific. Okay? And that's something we have to keep in mind. It's insufficient in and of itself. So, so as we consider that, it's, I mean, we like theists to go along with us, but we want to know how to live as Christians for Christ. So, so the downfall in how we got to where we were is really just it's liberalism in the church, it's the laziness of pastors, Christian, I mean, university administrators, I mean, you name it, who let people who disagree with our doctrine into these institutions. They will not do what Titus 1.9 says to exhort and sound doctrine and refute those who contradict. They care more about what the world says than what Jesus Christ will say to them when they meet him face to face. And that is, the, essentially, that's the problem. So how else did it go wrong, and what's the case for this? All right, um, particularly, we look at uh, how law fell the field. Back in the 17th century, there was actually a connection that, again, as there was a connection between the Bible, theology, and all other integrative areas or disciplines. Because what you had was a, a systematic theology, and the Bible was actually used in some part in developing law. Why? Because it's the surest source of law that we can know. How can you know right and wrong? Well, we have it by the Word of God. Now, these Protestant reformers, they didn't just willy-nilly take the law of Moses, you know, and start, you know, creating a, uh, you know, a new sacrificial system or something like that. They were true nomologists. They were studiers of the law. They understood how to, how to strip the principles of the law and then apply them to their present-day situation. You can't find a decent you know, Christian nomologist today who understands the Bible that way. And then you, know, you might find some uh, theonomists who want to sort of reinstitute all of it uh, at one point, but it's hard to find good nomology today. But then during the Enlightenment, all of a sudden we can't have special revelation anymore and a transcendent revelation guiding us. So what do we have now? It's reduced to being only natural law. So what you've got is conscience okay, which is grounded in, of course, divine revelation being the ultimate guide. Well, and the problem was is that conscience became, yeah, well, in a, in a shell of a Christian culture where we sort of knew what the natural law was because all these propositions were fixed by our thoughts on it, well, that, that went okay well for a while, but then eventually natural law was whatever people wanted to make it out to be. So then what happened in the 20th century? Well, as the modernism followed natural law, they sort of devolved in the 20th century into what's called legal positivism, okay? Mm -hmm. Legal positivism was the view that law is nothing more than what a culture says it is. So you look at the epistemology of law, how we know it. Once you've got an epistemology that says we can't have transcendent knowledge 
of law, then law is nothing more than what a legislative body or a court says it is. You, there's no higher authority to which we may appeal, period. So, that's, uh, so what you get is a cultural relativism for law. And you want to know what the problems? How do you judge that law? Say, and so when you think about public morality and, and public legality, you get the same problems in doing ethics. I mean, think about uh, reformers' dilemmas. If you have cultural relativism, anyone who tries to change the culture is immoral, if what the culture says is true. But what happens when you get a Martin Luther King or a Gandhi or someone trying to end oppression when you've got official oppression in the culture? They're by definition immoral. Well, that's the problems with legal positivism. What was the defense of the Nazis at the Nuremberg trial? Legal positivism. Law is nothing more than what a culture says it is, and who are you to judge? That was their defense. And they said, well, because you violated uh, natural law and the laws of uh, nature and nature's God, this is why we're convening the court and judging you. They went back to at least natural law to judge them. And then, so that was uh, legal positivism, and then today what we get in the postmodern age is critical legal studies. Okay? Now, what's critical legal studies? Critical legal studies is, in effect, when you hear that term, the Constitution is a living, breathing document. Okay? That's, you're hearing critical legal studies. And that is, what's postmodernism in its worst forms? If there's any truth out there, we can't know it because everything is perspectival. You're trapped by your own perspectives. You can't know any objective truth. Okay? If that's true, how do you apply that to law and judicial theory? How, how can I really know authorial intent and the original meaning of the Constitution? I can't. And in the process of legislative, executive, judicial branch, who's the one who's going to end up being the final say on applying law to facts? Judges. And then who are the ones who are the final say in the courts? The Supreme Court. So you end up with, as they say, nine people in black robes. And if you get uh, you know, five out of the nine who essentially can look at the Constitution as a blank page, and then read whatever's on their mind onto the page, that's the new law of the land. So you do not have a rule of law society anymore. All you have is a rule of judges society. So that's critical legal studies. So New York Constitution is a living, breathing document. Uh, all you can say is, you know, as our former chief executive says, you know, the Constitution doesn't inhale, okay? Uh, not at all, unless there's an amendment to the Constitution. That's how it inhales. So, but that's how we went from a rule of law constitutional society into literally five out of nine people changing the destiny of 300 million people sitting in a, in a marble room in Washington, D.C. So that, that was the downfall legally. So what we need is we need to go back simply to a transcendent basis for law and justice. We need a transcendent basis and fixed area of knowledge and morality. And for us as Christians, it's pretty simple. We know what that is. We know that it's Jesus Christ, his word, sound theology, and all the, the proper Christian disciplines of Christian philosophy and law on which they're built. I mean, I'll, and I'll close with this, then I'll turn it over to Dr. Waller. But as we consider this, think about what Thomas Aquinas said. An unjust law is no law at all. Okay? How, how, would, how does a critical legal studies person think about something like that? See, or a naturalist. You think about someone who's a legal positivist. An unjust law is no law at all. Well, what's justice? See, they're just, they're, 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 their minds go into a logic loop at that point. An unjust law is no law at all. Twitch, 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 right? You know, no, you have to have a transcendent basis. You have to have a God who is ultimately the ground of moral propositions and legal propositions to be able to test any positive and act positively enacted law, okay? So anyway, those are, you know, that's the case. And all I can say is for us is, uh, you know, we don't lose hope. And I'll, I'll cover this when we get to the theology. If God is for us, who can be against us? That's why it's good to study history. This is not the worst it's ever been in human history. 
Uh, it's been pretty bad before, and there have been great awakenings, there have been revivals, there have been reformations, and all it takes is the church to wake up. If the church wakes up, then we'll, you'll make an influence on the culture. But the way to do that is just go back to the Bible, go back to solid biblical orthodoxy, and uncompromising self-sacrifice in the service of Christ in all these areas, and you will see it turn around. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.